Okay, great. All right. Well, welcome everybody. This is the uh, October, um, I should say the 12th meeting of the PVC. And tonight we have uh, three agenda items, um, five counting the approved and the uh, PVC other business. We have the approved the minutes, then we have the public safety. We have the Emory Grover update and also the Jack Cogswell update. Um, and to kick off the top of the agenda is to approve the minutes. Do I hear a move to approve the meeting minutes of the last meeting? So, so moved. Thank you, Richard. Any second? Second. Thank you, Erwin. Okay. I'm going to go do roll call. We're still in a virtual meeting. Richard? Aye. George? Aye. Erwin? Aye. Chair's eye. Great. Okay, that takes care of that agenda item. Before we go to the uh, public safety, if I may, uh, Steve Gentile, could you just do me a favor? If any other PBC member member joins, just give me a heads up because I'm just keeping track because of what I can see on the screen. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, let's move to the next agenda item, which is the public safety complex and fire station two update. All right. Let me get my screen up here okay who else Let's do we have here. who else do we have attending we have dennis uh miles and keith mercy from the architect's office okay good thank you all right the uh the update for the project at uh, headquarters uh they're filling in along the uh, phase line. We took down the uh, phase line temporary walls and have put up panels to separate it from the uh, existing building. And they're working on the sheetrock, the concrete infill, and all that good stuff along the uh, phase line. The upper level sheetrock and tape is substantially complete. Uh, paint is uh, um, more than well underway, except the phase line area. The, uh, the paint's pretty much done. And they're working on the uh, ceiling grid. They're mostly done with that, and they've started putting in the uh, the finishes in the uh, in the ceiling for the for the sprinklers. The one uh, drawback is the the lights. We're having trouble getting the lights. Uh, unclear as to when they're going to be coming in. So stay tuned for any schedule impact on on those. Uh, main level and the. Uh, Lower level sheetrock is substantially complete and they're taping on both those levels. The MEP finished work, as I said, is starting on the upper level. Uh, they started working down in the firing range, action target. Uh, outside, the plaza wall work is underway for the planters and the seating walls. The metal panel work continues on the exterior of the building and they've started mill work on the, on the upper level and have deliveries for the, uh, the main level. Over at Fire Station 2, the upper level, the finishes are substantially complete, and they're hoping to get uh, KBA in there for um, punch list uh, uh, very soon. Uh, the apparatus floors on both levels are completed, the epoxy flooring. Site work's ongoing. They started spreading uh, loam today. Uh, curbing is mostly done. They, they poured uh, concrete aprons today and uh, looking to do the final pave on Monday. Uh, main level and lower level finishes are mostly complete and working on all kinds of little detail stuff on both those levels. Uh, metal panels are finishing up in the rear of the building. They did the last overhead door today, the door itself. Now they got to do the, uh, the motors and then they'll be moving over to headquarters to do those overhead doors in the, uh, in the Sally port. Still shooting for substantial completion on November 5th. We've got our move scheduled for November 8th. And uh, police substantial completion uh, mid-January to early February. And as I said, stay tuned for the uh, to any potential impact for the, uh, the two by two light fixtures. Anybody have any questions on the schedule and the project update? I, I have one. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned landscaping, I'm assuming that landscaping mm -hmm. uh, for bushes and things like that are rescheduled for spring? Uh, only for headquarters. They will be put in for, we're still in a planting season. 
uh, and the landscape will be planting uh, over the next uh, two weeks. Okay, that, that's probably going to be okay. <clears throat> I can't remember what the what the landscaping was for fire station two, but if you get bushes in within the next couple of weeks, it should be okay. It's to November 15th, George, for the fall planting season. Yeah, I, I know, <clears throat> I know paper wise it is, but reality wise, it's best to get them in before the end of October, but, but that's fine. They will be. They're, they're guaranteed anyway, right? They're going to be, well, yeah, they're warrant, the warranties for two years, no matter what. But yeah, right yeah. now we're, we should have them all in by the last week of October 25th. That's good. Derek, we have a couple other questions, one from Erwin, one from Barry. Okay, thank you, Erwin. Yes, thank you. Ken, can you give us a worst case projection on the delay for the lights? We talking I, about a minor delay or major delay? Any idea? I can't because uh, the the manufacturer can't even give the contractor a, a delivery date on the lights. So I can't I can't comment on that. As soon as we have something, I can let everyone know. Some of the lights are are <laughs> supposedly in, although they haven't been delivered yet. But they they're saying they've only got 150, and we need you know twice that many. So. Um, We'll just uh, continue to play that by ear and see what the uh, um, what we get for uh, for delivery dates. Thank you, Harry. Yeah, uh, Ken. The, um, the what's the projected move-in date for the PD? For PD? Yeah, mid mid, mid January. Um, you know, we'll, okay. We'll, We'll finesse that as we, you know, as we get closer and, you know, depending on what the lights do. But right now, I think it's somewhere around the, the 16th, substantial completion, somewhere around the 16th. So we'd move sometime within a week uh, after the okay. substantial completion. Hey, Ken, are these, the, uh, as far the lighting goes, I know that uh, material uh, delivery is questionable. Are you, are these all two by twos or are they just an assorted, yeah. they're all two by twos? It's, it's mostly two by twos, although, Miles, correct me if I'm wrong, but there was an issue also with the uh, the lights in the uh, detention area too, correct? Yeah, so the the information you've been speaking on of we have potentially half um, is all the two by two, just acoustical ceiling lights that goes up in the grid. Uh, we don't have anything for the detention fi or fixtures right now, which is a combination of the hallway and then also within the cells. The detention fixtures are those safety lights, secure, like security lights, where they're yes. different type of, of, of enclosure and okay. Yeah, it's completely different manufacturer. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I don't see any hands up. Does this um, uh, does this apply to both the fire station two and the police? No, fire station two is done. We've got everything. Everything there. Lighting's all in. Yes, this is only for police. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, talk okay. about the, the ACL next. Uh, some of the usual suspects are on here. The uh, um, the the, uh, the the big new one is the irrigation meter revisions. Uh, evidently, the town does not do cannot do subtraction in the uh, in the water department. So what we have to do is we have to put on the irrigation meter has to go on in line before the main water meter. And while at fire station two, it's not as big a deal at headquarters. If you can imagine the basement of the fire department about the middle of the building, that's where the main meter is. The irrigation meter, the, the line comes out of the building on the school street end of PD. So we'd have to, right now, we've got to pipe a whole new line from basically where the existing water meter is to the, um, to the end of the building. Had a conversation with our new uh, water superintendent, Mr. Retsky, 
and he said it was above his pay grade. So um, I need to, I'm going to have a conference. Once the numbers actually come in and we see what the impact on this is, uh, then I'll be having a conversation with Bob Lewis to, to understand, try and understand why you can't just take that amount, whatever that meter reads, deduct it once on the main meter. That's what I'm used to doing in, uh, in other locales, but evidently Needham doesn't do that. So we'll see what we can, uh, what we can drum up at the end. If it turns out to be not a huge number, we'll probably just go ahead and do it. But uh, I'm not uh, enamored with the idea of spending seventeen thousand dollars just because they won't do they won't do math. I think that's but, a big topic. Yep, George. That, that's a that's a lot of that buys a lot of water. Seventeen thousand so, dollars. Yeah. They well, it's not so much the buying the water, George. It's uh, what they what they don't do it's you know with irrigation you don't get whacked with the sewage charge i understand that my point is that's worth the, that's worth an awful lot i know get I know. rid of that seventeen thousand. i'm with you i'm with you not necessary at all yeah, and, like and again said, again what are you doing ken what what's the next steps on that one well, when I'm, I'm waiting waiting now uh, miles is pricing it out and when he gets the final number, we'll take a look at it. We'll review it. We'll see if there's anything we can do to, to shave it down any. But let's just say it comes in at you know $15,000. I'll take the numbers and sit down with Bob Lewis and say, hey, come on. You know, maybe we'll do uh, Fire Station 2, but at headquarters, listen, we don't want to repipe this whole thing. Right. Why can't, why can't we just, you know, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get Mike Retzke to, to, to volunteer to read the meter every month. Or something. There you go. There you go. Is uh, and again, um, Steve Gentile. I apologize if I'm missing anybody's hands up. Um, you could just help me manage who's got questions. If there's another no question, the only question I have, Ken, is the burn rate. Um, you know, the we've infamous got, burn rate. We're way down. Now, we're not. We've got 110,000 a month left, based on four more months. Sure, but but we're way below the sixty now per Absolutely. month. Absolutely, is that fair? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Great. Any other questions? Uh, about, about the COVID COVID nineteen costs, are those still realistic, or are we doing anything? No, no. To if you re if you recall, George, I took what was left from what town meeting had funded, and put it in there because I did not want anyone thinking we had an extra. Hundred and sixty thousand to spend. Right. My my goal my goal is there, there there will be some cost posted against that because of delays with the mill work at Fire Station Two. We may have some delays as a result of these lights at at police headquarters also. But my goal is to spend what we have to to cover true COVID costs and then just rebate that money back. Okay, but the the the, the reality between us girls is that. We're not going to spend all of that for COVID nineteen. Correct. Correct. Do we have an estimate as to what approximately mm -hmm. that is at this point? No, I no, I don't. Okay. I can't. I can't tell. I can't tell you what the, you know. Certainly, with the lights at uh, um, at headquarters, if there's going to be any you know delays uh, to that, I I I can't say. Okay. No, I meant I meant potential COVID costs. That's what I mean. The, 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 I, I would consider the delays to the lights as COVID costs because it's a COVID-related delay to the materials. understand. Okay. Okay, great. All right, All that's, right Ken, I think That's good voting. for me, Stuart. You can go to the, 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 uh, the voting items. Okay, I'm looking at your spreadsheet, Catherine, and I've got, starting with the change order number 33, for 27,056, and that's where we should start. And then we can go down through the invoices. So I will put forth for approval the Consigli Construction Change Order number 33, coming out of the general contracting budget for 27,000. It? It's 32, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's, that's, it's that's 33. A that's a typo. It's thir 33 is the correct number. That's a typo. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And that change order is $27,056. Do I hear a second? Second. Second. Thank you, Richard. Um, any questions? Hearing none, 
seeing none, we're going to come to the vote. And I believe Dennis is on the line. Is there any other user uh, group on besides Dennis, Steve Gentile? No. Okay, thank you. So I will start with uh, Richard. Aye. George. Aye. Erwin. Aye. Chief Condon. Aye. And the chair is aye. Okay. I am going to put forth the invoice for Contigli construction requisition number 33 through September 2021, coming out of the general contracting budget for 1,700, oh, excuse me, <laughs> 1 million. I wish. Well, I'd love to, I wish I could shrink those costs, I exactly, um, apologize. $1,735,135.06. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, George. Any questions? Hearing none coming to the vote. Richard? Aye. George? Aye. Erwin? Aye. Chief Condon? Aye. Chair is aye. The next invoice is for Castle Booz. September 2021 services coming out of the architecture budget for $17,930.80. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, George. Any questions? Hearing none, coming to the vote. Richard? Aye. George? Aye. Erwin? Aye. Dan, Chief Condon? Aye. Chairs, aye. Um, I'm going to put forth three invoices coming out of miscellaneous budget um, collectively uh, for a vote, approval vote. Um, the first one is the pods, $114.99 for the uh, CP rental. Next one is the pods for the BX rental, $114.99. And the last part of the miscellaneous set of invoices is UTS for materials testing at Fire Station 2 for $280, total of $509.98. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Erwin. Any questions? Hearing none, coming to the vote. Richard? Aye. George? Aye. Erwin? Aye. Chief Condon? Aye. Chair is aye. Okay, I'm gonna put forth five invoices coming out of the FF&E budget. Uh, starting with um, the first one, a convection oven for $2,091. Workbenches for $1,528.76. Cabinet and eye wash station for $1,801.40. <coughs> Excuse me. Shelving for $292.50. And additional shelving for $114.15 for a total of 200. Excuse me. Total of $2,091. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Richard. Any questions? Hearing none, coming to the vote. Richard? Aye. George? Aye. Erwin? Aye. Chief Condon? Aye. And the chair is aye. I believe that is all invoices for public safety, Ken and Catherine. That is correct. Aye. Yes, it I, is. I have, a, okay. I have a quick question. Maybe I George. misunderstood what you said, but um, the invoices for Granger, how many of them were there? Were there Five. four? Five. 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 And the total was how much? 2,091. No, that's the amount, no, that's the amount that, of one of the invoices. No, okay. that's- Okay, I messed up. I, they, they're not adding- That's not them, correct. The, the you're correct, is, that isn't, yeah. Total is much larger than that. Yeah, it'll be it'll be thirty three, thirty five. Yeah, fifty six hundred roughly. Okay. Do we want to clarify that in the uh, notes, Catherine? We we listed each invoice out. I, I just listed each invoice out separately. Right. So, so right. yep. That's so my right. error in calculation. So just leave off the total. Yep. Great. Okay. Thanks, George. I I, th I thought okay. my math was 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 wrong there for a minute, but. You were, you were testing me here. Anyway, yeah. good. We kept you on your toes. All right. Any questions, yep. further questions for the public safety team? Nope. Not for me. Hearing, hearing none, 
I will close this item. Thank you very much to everybody for that. And we will close the public safety and we will open the agenda item for the Emory Grover um, update. And who's gonna have that, Hank? Uh, yes, and um, we, Steve, you can chime in as well. Um, if I can share my screen, let's see. Bringing in Joel and um, Dan Gutekunst, but they're not coming in. Let's see what happens. Dan Gutekunst is coming in on his iPhone. Are we all set or are we still waiting for Dan to come in? Dan and Joel can both talk. Um, I'm having a little trouble bringing them in on the video. Yeah, I'm. I, uh, can you uh, hear me, uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, I can. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm driving uh, at the moment, so but I can, I can hear and speak if necessary. I'm wondering if the car, doesn't, the Zoom doesn't like the car um, aspect. Yeah, that's OK. I can see OK. Okay. Okay, I've okay. shared my screen and um, it has a summary of the options that we've discussed to date. Um, there was, we forwarded to you a uh, extensive um, package which included uh, Dan's memo to the finance committee uh, answering the various questions that they had raised. And hey, Hank. There, yes. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to pause for a second and just ask, and everybody may very well be up to speed, but I think with the number of meetings that have occurred over the last couple of weeks, Finance Committee, Select Board, School Committee, it might make sense since the last meeting we had, what meetings have taken place. We have the package here, but I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there's been a School Committee meeting and vote and a FinCom review, or is that coming up? The FinCom review and their vote on this topic is tomorrow night. Okay, but school committee voted that two weeks ago, am I correct? Well, they, they had previously approved the renovation, so they did not vote on it, but they are still in support of the Emory Grover renovation project. Okay, I just want everybody to know it's sort of the sequence of events and where we stand within that sequence. Okay, I think the last time we met, we had noted that after extensive review with the school committee, the um, square footage requirements of the project were reduced, a uh, revised plan, uh, and that reduction brought it down to uh, 21,385 square feet. Um, and that can fully fit within the existing building. The attic level has some occupied space. The majority of it is reserved for storage and mechanical space. Um, that renovation including the, the renovation number here, the 20,875 does include um, the fit out and the temporary use of the Hillside Elementary School for the 18 to 20 month period while the Emory Grover building is being um, reno fully renovated. <clears throat> the, the detailed breakdown was given to all of you, I think last meeting for that renovation cost, as well as the detailed breakout for each of the sub options uh, that had been requested by the Finance Committee and others to look at what option 1A is, a new building on Highland Avenue 
with that new building being about equal to this square footage requirement. Um, that cost of 21829 um, did it also include uh, temporary relocation over to Hillside and it um, assumed a two-story, not a three-story new building on that same site. Hank, Hank I, I would like to just interject one comment. <clears throat> the square footage is really, that's required, is a little bit above 18,000. There is 21,000 100 square feet in Emory Grover that will be renovated to accommodate the 1,404 square feet of program space that's required. So when we talk about a new building, we're talking about a smaller building than 21,000. I believe in Joel's numbers, he's been using 18,000 square feet Joel, do you want to just confirm that? That's correct. Okay. So for new buildings elsewhere or at, at Highland Avenue or at Hillside, we're using 18,000 square feet. So those numbers, those, those project numbers represent a somewhat smaller building than the total build out that we're doing at, at Emory Grover. But, and, but it meets the square footage requirements. It meets the square footage requirements, that's right. And, and a new building can be more efficient than renovation of the existing building, hence the difference. Yet, uh, to point out, Emory Grove of renovation is still less expensive than building a smaller building or an 18,000 square foot building on that site. I believe, Mr. Chair, this is Dan. I, I think the only caveat to all of that is that if we built a new, a, um, a new building at Hillside, we would, in, we would include IT likely. Um, so that does change the calculus there a little bit. Yeah, and that number is actually shown on this chart. Option 6B. Yeah. Or it's it, it's option 6A prime, if you will. Oh, it is. Okay. Okay. So um, the assumption was that if they were going to build new on that other site, it didn't make sense not to build with IT. Whereas in option 6B, um, the building has existing parts, and option 6B assumed the demolition of the modular classrooms and also the demolition of the 1968 um, edition, which was the area associated with the um, media center and about six classrooms total. Um, and that in option uh, 6B, the square footage was just the remainder <clears throat> of the original building fully renovated. So these, these notes down here, I think, um, explain those conditions. And there is a premium, obviously, associated with the soil abatement on the contaminated site in all of the option sixes, 6A, 6A prime, and 6B. Are there any other questions about those? Erwin? I think I have more. Oh, go ahead, Erwin. Quick question, uh, Hank. You mentioned that the new building on Highland would be a smaller building, but more efficient. Is there any way to quantify <laughs> the operating cost delta between uh, renovating the Emory Grover building as opposed to a new building at Highland? Uh, 
Um, in other words, uh, you're saying that new building would be more, would be more efficient. Is it, is it marginally? Um, is, is there enough of a, a savings and operating costs that, that could be a factor? Or does the kind of $1 million difference in overall price overwhelm any uh, savings and operating costs for uh, a new building at Highland? Well, and, uh, and Barry can correct me if I'm wrong, but the operating costs, probably the largest single operating cost is the custodian and the cleaning and all the ongoing maintenance. In all of the instances, um, LED lighting would be installed. So you would have very efficient lighting. Um, the, uh, in, in all cases, there would be an electrification of the building. So we would convert away from gas fired or oil fired heating. Um, and the efficiency of the envelope of the existing building compared to a new building, there probably would be some difference there. Plus we're, we're heat, we'd be heating and cooling a larger building. <clears throat> but currently, um, but I think that if you compare the new, new building to the existing building, um, they'd be similar in operating costs. Of course, we haven't gotten into the detail of um, the type of exterior envelope, so on and so forth. Okay, so it sounds like it, for now, it doesn't look like it's a factor that's gonna really put a dent on that $1 million differential between the the base and option 1A. Barry, do you have any comment on that, on what the operating cost you might be? You know, looking at it from this perspective, it's hard to quantify that, but Hank, you know, there's some good points to be made when you're looking at, um, you know, the efficiency of the envelope of the building where, uh, where the, um, the existing Emory Grover is uh, not, would not be as efficient as building a, a new structure, especially when it comes to thermal breaks between the exterior and the interior. Uh, you could make up for that with additional insulation um, and additional, um, you know, uh, means and methodologies of, of, of renovating uh, an existing building. But it, it, to, to quantify that, it would be hard. I mean, you're going to have similar systems that are probably installed in the, in the new building as you would in an existing building. We're not going to not uh, look at electrifying um, of the electrification of, of, you know, renovating the Emory Grover um, as we would to a new, a new building, looking at like air side type uh, heat pumps and, you know, removing um, as much uh, fossil fuel as possible. It's, it's really hard. You can, you can make an existing building potentially is, is, is energy efficient as a new building um, with a lot of ingenuity. So, I mean, it's I think it's really hard to quantify whether or not it would be a wash in the end. Is it gonna be more to, to operate an older building, especially if it's renovated properly? Um, you know, you, the, the existing building is still gonna require the same amount of, of, you know, filter changes for HVAC. It's gonna, still gonna require uh, the same amount of uh, custodial support, trade support, um, again, I think it really comes down to constructing the envelope of an existing building vice a new building and how to make it the, as efficient as possible, especially when it comes to, you know, the, uh, you know thermal insulation uh, on an existing building. So it's, you know, it's, it, 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 is, it is hard to quantify, I think. It would be very difficult. From the maintenance standpoint, it would be a wash. Is that right? I From mean, a maintenance standpoint, if we're looking at the same, if we're looking at the same, like we're going to obviously the re replacing windows, we're going to upgrade insulation. We're probably going to uh, some sort of means and methods for thermal breaks between the outside and, and inside. The roof is going to be most likely reconstructed. Um, the maintenance, though, overall, when the building's done, I think the maintenance would very well be um, similar. Now. You do have on, on a new building on Highland, you potentially have uh, the option of, of geothermal where you could look at that as a possibility, um, which would reduce the overall uh, energy costs. Uh, however, I'm not sure if that's something that was even considered, but you know, something like that may be a, a, a consideration and it would 
have an effect on the overall operating costs, but uh, custodial and, and, and trade support, I think would be very similar between a new building and, a, and a, an existing renovated building. Right. Thank you. I, I guess the one difference is that in a new building it could be designed, the roof could be designed to accept solar panels, uh, which we cannot do on the existing building. So you would have that initial upfront investment, but long-term savings. Although in this, let's see, in this, we'd only have nine, roughly 9,000 square feet of roof area of which if we said 75% of it were usable for, uh, for solar, then we'd have to go look at it uh, in, in more detail, but that would be a smaller array than what is proposed at the Jack Cogswell building, for instance. I have a question. George. Um, the uh, current thinking, I, I guess this question is for um, the architect. What's the current thinking about what kind of a heating and HVAC system you're gonna use? Is it heat pumps? It's heat pumps. It's a VRF variable refrigerant flow heat pump um, in both buildings. And it's a central system, so it's um, it doesn't necessarily have to generate heat. It can redistribute heat within the building before it has to generate. So if one side of the building is warm and the other side is cool, it'll just transfer that heat by virtue of it, of it being a centralized heat pump. You think there's any any possibility of uh, of um... Uh, using the um, same kind of system we use at PSAP? Um, you could. I think that what folks are finding is that the air-to-air -air heat pumps as efficient now and less expensive than the water source heat pump, which would be a geothermal. Okay. And not only that, um, geothermal on a small parcel is problematic with regard to the schedule and the coordination. You have to get the wells in place, um, which basically prohibits uh, access to any staging area for the construction. So that sequence was important when we developed PSAB, but right. we, had the, we had the ability to stage and, and put in the wells before we got into the construction. Correct. Okay. So I, I just wanted to put that out of the way. I, I, I didn't think it was a real valuable option, but um, just wanted to put that on the table. And Joel, was there some rule of thumb you had where the uh, ground source heat pump might be three times the cost or four times the cost? of the air source um, in the initial in investment? We did an analysis on another project with Allied and it, it was adding um, about $250,000 just for the wells and it, it didn't have an appreciable uh, impact on the, on the um, operation of the system. So it, you know, it was just, it, it was not selected. We did a pretty in-depth study and, and found it not to be effective um, at the moment. All right. The main the main reason I brought it up here is is it was mentioned and it's the kind of thing that sometimes people at town meeting might mention as you know did you consider this and and we just need to be ready to say yes we did but it doesn't make sense for the following reasons that's all. Well, we, we are only at feasibility stage. And um, doesn't certainly stop them from asking questions, Hank. All right. Okay. Okay. Are there other questions? I can't see the screen, Steve, if you can just check or Hank. So, um, Stuart. There's no questions. Ed? Thank you. Steve. At tomorrow's uh, FinCom, 
I'm sure it, it will be, I will, it would, <clears throat> it would be appropriate to say that we've reviewed the architect's work and this is what it is. We're not making any recommendation. However, we are stating that we have reviewed the architect's work and these are the numbers that have come out of the study. And George, yes, and I, George has his hand raised. Stuart. No, I, I, I didn't mean to do that. I thought okay, I was taking it down. Sorry, okay. okay. So, so I agree, Steve. I, I think, and, and just for the committee's benefit, Steve and I communicated a little bit on this, um, and I may have communicated with others, but my uh, belief of the committee is that we have produced um, what we were asked to produce, which is insight into these options. And recently with the uh, school admin or uh, school committee asking us to produce these options through BHNA, we've done the work. I think there's been, and Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's a, there's a bit of effort to get the PVC to take a position or a preference on one of these options. And if I can just add, Dan, don't be afraid to jump in too, but, and, and if you guys are asking us to make it a, a preference, I'm not sure if it's appropriate for this committee to do that simply because there are choices. And I think the most important statement we can make as a committee, um, and it's open for debate, is that I believe we are um, here to provide the best insight possible given the options. And these options are all very viable. And the most important piece is that the school administration with the needs that they have are provided with options that allow them to perform and operate the way they feel best for the town. Sure, there's a vote out there. Sure, the school committee and the rest of the town needs to vote on various things. But what we've been asked to do from a scope perspective is uh, provide this kind of insight. I don't think the BBC should be taking any position at this stage. I leave that open to debate and for other comments. Um, I don't want to go too broad, but I just think for your what you're saying, Steve, um, I agree. We've reviewed these options and and uh, they all seem seem viable and in good standing. Anybody else have a comment? Sure. Your hand up, George. Yes. Um, I think it is appropriate, though, for us to mention, uh, for example, um, the fact that the schedule would be affected if we went with option 1A um, compared to Emory Grover renovation because of the fact that there'd be a, a, a period where you'd have to wait before you could do anything. Isn't that correct? But but George, if that's the case, though, that's just a constraint, right? Is that really? But but that's an important piece of information for yes. people that are voting on this. Uh, it really is. Sure. Uh, you know, the fact that you know we 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 need a building for school administration as soon as possible. The reality is that the base case will get us that. Isn't that correct? Correct. Right. That's the, that's the earliest schedule that we could open up a building and and bring these people back in there. I think that's that's really important, and we need to make sure that people understand that. So I think that's important as well, not just the cost and not the fact that we've just looked at all the options, but uh, I think we need to somehow uh, connect it to schedule because. Uh, you know, let's let's hope we don't run into a problem with that building uh, and and not serving uh, the the school administration properly until we until we build the new one. But but uh, it's possible. So the sooner the better, really. And I think that's important that we put that in there somehow. It, I, I think that's identified in the notes on this particular slide, which has been also sent to FinCom. I, I understand so it's that. The fourth bullet, yeah. But that, I, I, I know it's in the notes. 90% um, of the people don't read the notes, they read the, 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 the first set of numbers. So I think it's important that people recognize that, that 
these aren't all the same schedule. Yeah, right. it's in the notes, but it's important that they recognize what what is the whether it's our recommendation or not. It certainly is is a better opportunity because it's the lowest cost and it has the best schedule. Correct. That message has to come across, I think, to people at, at town meeting and the FinCom as well. Okay. Okay, I see Dan Gudekans has his hand raised. Dan? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. You know, you asked the question about, uh, you know, what, or I'll phrase it this way, what's expected. And by the way, I think my, my camera, I finally made it home, but I have to reboot my computer to get the camera back on. And I won't take the time to do that. Um, and, uh, but I'm sitting here with a tie and a suit on, just so you know, it's a blue tie <laughs> and a shirt, just for the visual. We're really um, impressed. Well, we, I just want you to know. Um, <laughs> I think what would be would be helpful to the to the community and to the school committee, the finance committee and town meeting is for the for the building committee to say, looking at this sheet, for example, and everything that went before it, that the PBBC has had an opportunity to, if you will, kick the tires on these different options and that you agree that these options and the numbers that they represent are, are as accurate as possible. Um, and that you feel confident in, in letting town meeting know, finance committee, school committee, that uh, there's been due diligence in, in um, kind of sussing out all of these different options and that uh, you stand by uh, these numbers if that's something that you feel you could do. Um, so I, I think that would be, uh, be helpful for the conversation for I think, I think town meeting respects the work of the PPBC. PPBC has a long, long and a storied, I think now, uh, history of uh, vetting projects, bringing them in within cost, often under the cost, um, and for PPBC to make that statement. In this case, at this point, if it's possible, I think would be helpful. Is that, Steve, something that, I mean, we sort of have that commentary out there, but is this, is this are you suggesting, Dan, a, a written, a more formal written perspective or? I think something um, stated. I don't think it has to be written. Could it, could it be in the uh, meeting notes that the committee agrees, has reviewed and agreed? agrees with the information presented? <clears throat> I think that's an open question. I mean, I, I believe that we've all voiced our, you know, through the time of this challenge for the school administration, each project, each option, all the meetings we've had, we've always vetted all the different pieces. Um, and I believe even with this now being presented back, um, we've, in our questions, in our discussions, we have expressed and tried to unturn any stone that may be costly, maybe in contradiction to what's trying to be done, but in the context of the scope of each option, I think we vetted each piece. So. I think our notes reflect that. I'm just wondering if there needs to be um, more of a, of a, I'm just thinking out loud here. It, do we need to have on our cover letters, because I think we produced uh, some of that, maybe an additional statement around how we vetted this process entirely and that we, um, I don't know, no stone goes unturned. I, I'm just sort of gonna talk out loud if somebody has another opinion. You know, Steve Popper, do you have a thought in terms of, and unfortunately I cannot be at the finance committee tomorrow, um, but you and Hank certainly can voice this from the committee. Well, I think you've, you've already done that, Stuart. We in the did, cover. We did send this cover letter to- Yep. 
select board and FinCom and basically transmitted this information um, that you see on the slide. And there was another summary slide that had identified some of the earlier work that we had done. Um, so I think by virtue of you conveying this, you are giving the message that this is the product uh, that the building committee has produced through its due diligence and it's out there for others to make the decision where to go. Right. And we wrote that letter. And I think, Dan, we shared that with you or Steve forwarded it to you. Um, I, I think I would just put out in the open if, if you feel there is a, a, a additional commentary relative to what we're discussing now and we've openly discussed needs to be voiced in there differently um, or in addition. I just ask if, if you let us know because we'll be happy to, to uh, clarify anything that's in there. No, I, I think that's fine. I just, um, and if there is a letter I missed, which is quite possible, um, I'll catch up with Steve to see what that is. Okay. Okay, great. Um, There's a raised hand by Barry DeLong. Barry? Yes, thanks. Sorry. Um, this, I have a question, and in, this may have already been addressed. Um, and I apologize if I'm, um, you know, putting this back out there. So between the Emory Grover renovation and the 6B, um, you know, the base in 6B, there's a, there's a huge delta. And um, part of that is, you know, 5,000 square feet especially, I'm sorry, on 6A, uh, there's 5,000 square feet added for IT. How, I mean, when, like right now, IT, um, IT is using space at Hillside and uh, they have using um, quite a bit of space at Broad Meadow. Where, like, if somebody asks that question, well, you know, we're going to go with the base, you know, 20 million, you know, poor IT, how are they going to, how are they going to continue to operate? What are their options right now? I know uh, Mark Messias and I have we've been talking a lot about renovating space for them, and we're con they're constantly looking for space. And um, you know, when you walk into Broad Meadow down where uh, IT is, it's, it's ceiling to to floor with you know um, equipment um, in boxes, and there's hallways that are filled with you know old equipment and new equipment. How do we address that when somebody says, "Well, you know"? We're, how is IT operating? Why do we have that option on the table now? Is that is that an absolute necessity for IT for the for the school IT to have this new additional five thousand square feet? And if it's if they can operate without it, why why is this even being presented um, as as an option? Well, I I, I guess okay. I would just quickly I, I quickly answer um, if I may, Mr. Chair. The, the idea there is that we're, we're, we've taken IT out of the 1330 Highland Avenue plan because it's residing right now both at Hillside and Broadmeadow. And it will reside at Hillside and Broadmeadow until it no longer can. Um, and if we are going to, if we were going to renovate Hillside to make that a permanent home for school administration and operations, it would make sense to wrap IT into that uh, program. You could do it as another option suggests without it. Um, but I would suggest that we would try to do it with it. But the question is, how are they operating now without that? It, that's a lot of square footage for night. And, and you're talking about just a shell space where they can just start plugging stuff in, or are we talking about high end, high speed, uh, it type space where we're buying all kinds of additional equipment. Is this just layup space for them to program computers to plug stuff in and to put up some offices um, for administrators and, um, and operators? Or is this truly like high speed, we're looking at new equipment in, in, um, in, in, this, in a build out, like a fit out? Or is this just really shell space for them to kind of put all stuff more boxes and IT equipment into? It, it's all of the above. It, it's just a lot, words, of, that's a lot of square footage to add to a to a um, to a project for one specific 
um, department when they're operating now. And I know, Dan, I know for a fact they're, they're squeezed tight. I mean, they, they take up cafeterias during the summertime to reprogram computers and do the work that they have to do to get ready for the next school year. So I'm not saying they don't need it, um, but that's a lot of square footage for a, a one department to add to the overall budget to a, um, to a, a construction project. Right. I, I, I would think that the, the two kindergarten classrooms they occupy now have got to be about 2,400 square feet or 2,000 square feet. And then you add into the square footage at Broadmeadow. Broad yeah. You know, you add up, you're, you're already almost there. So this wouldn't be in addition to what they're operating and this would be their new operating space. This would replace it. Got it. And, and part of the cost, and correct me if I'm wrong, part of the cost would be in this instance, the relocation of the hub um, yes. from Broadmeadow to, um, in this case, uh, Hillside. Yes, the head end room, yep, yep. And that was taken into consideration in the estimate for that, I would imagine, because that's a big number, that's a big swing. Yes, yep. that's part of why it's such a big swing. Thank you. Any other questions? We have one voting item, but before that, is there anything else, Hank, you need to cover? I, um, I guess I have one question that relates to town George? meeting. I'm, I'm thinking ahead of time here, uh, but uh, is there anything else we need to do? Who's gonna be presenting this at town meeting? Is it, is it, uh, the uh, select board is a school school committee. Do you know, Dan? It's going to be uh, presented because it's a capital article. It's the select board's article. So between the um, select board and the school committee, they will uh, do a presentation. I imagine there'll be a member of the select board speaking. And I know that Dr. Barr will also speak. Okay. No, those are pre-recorded, correct? Uh, there, there are going to be two things. There's going to be um, available on the town's website this Friday will be a uh, visual presentation of frequently asked questions with pictures and with questions. There will also be available a video of what school administration and operations looks like inside uh, the Emory Grover building. There um, will also be an electronic version of the detailed frequently asked questions, which has also been mailed out to town meeting members. I don't know if anybody on this call is a town meeting member received that in the mail yet. Yes, no, we I have. haven't received any. I, I, didn't I receive received it. Yet. Okay. I received it on Saturday. Okay. Well, it should be arriving in the next day or two for those who didn't. And um, the chair, uh, County Bar will also do a, a video presentation that will be available on the town's website on Friday. Um, and then at town meeting itself, the moderator is allowing the proponents and the finance committee to each give a five minute presentation. So between Dr. Barr and a member of the select board, one of them will present for five minutes on this article the Finance Committee will also have five minutes to present. And I believe that's how it's going to go for each article. The proponent will have five minutes to speak and the Finance Committee as appropriate will have five minutes to speak. Okay. Anything else, George? No. Okay, great. Hank, anything else that we need to cover besides the voting item? Um, I don't think so. Just the voting item. Okay. Okay. So for the committee, we have one voting item for BHNA, for the September services of $13,025 put forth for approval. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, George. Any questions? Hearing none, coming to the vote. In terms of the vote, we have the, the uh, committee, and then we also have Dan. Do we have anybody else on the user committee? I no, don't. I don't believe so. Okay, 
Thank you. All right. So starting the roll call, Richard? Aye. George? Aye. Erwin? Aye. Dan? Aye. And the chair is aye. Okay. Thank you. I think that's it for the Emory Grover agenda item tonight. And we will close that topic down. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, others, uh, for this. And we will now shift to the uh, JCB update. That will be you, Hank, I believe. Let me get another thing up on the screen. I forwarded a summary. And uh, let's see, Steve is a Beth. On. Uh, Beth is not here. I'm sorry if I didn't invite her. No, that that's fine. I think we can cover it. Um, let me get this other thing open. Karis is here, yeah. um, but she's not coming in. <laughs> I think the key is, Hank, correct, is, is the update really is the move into the PPA framework. Um, that That is correct. Correct. Um, as you get this view, full screen, share my screen. Um, those of you who are members of the um, town meeting will note that the warrant article has been drafted to authorize the select board to enter into a PPA, a power purchase agreement for the installation of the solar on top of Jack Cogswell. Um, that after going through the analyses, um, it was determined that the value, assuming we can get net metering, uh, let me reduce this in size slightly. Can you all see this chart? Um, Yes. Okay. So um, the PPA with net metering credits over a 25 year period is somewhere between the best case and the conservative case scenarios. Um, however, in order to get that, we do need to go through that, cross that one hurdle that we discussed at the last meeting which is getting authorization from the Department of Public Utilities to have uh, two facilities on one site. That one site being the 71 acre RTS building. Um, we had discussed this previously, but had not, um, I had not fully realized that the um, Jack Cogswell building, the, the only parcel that's being joined in the um, case before the land court is a parcel of about four acres. It's on, on the very western side of the property and um, is nowhere near the Jack Cogswell building. If the original property lines were still uh, intact, um, the Jack Cogswell building would be on a different parcel from the uh, RTS uh, Mound Solar X. Because it is not, we have to get this approval from DPU that application is being prepared. Uh, Beth and I are working with town council on preparing that. Um, it will likely, the appeal will likely take six to eight months to uh, go through their process. <clears throat> Beth felt reasonably confident that our um, application would be received and reviewed favorably and the permission would be granted. If it's not, then our only other alternative is this, our purchase agreement with alternative on bill credits, line number seven down here, and the financial benefit to the town is significantly less. And that's because the um, reimbursement rate or the net metering rate drops from a retail rate down to a wholesale rate, basically. Um, 
<clears throat> so the that application is being prepared. Um, it does require a signature or uh, an affidavit by the town manager, which will probably require action by by uh, select board. And whether they can grant they can do all of that prior to town meeting is is not known yet. Um, but we would hope to put it forward to them as soon as possible. Um, when we went through these other options, we were not sure what the borrowing rate would be, what the um, total cost would be, and the worst case scenario was roughly a break-even basis, slightly worse than break-even. Um, if we went through the process in the original drafting of the warrant article, there had been a um, recommendation that we rescind the 2.2 million that's left in the contingency and allocate three quarters of a million for the construction of this project. FinCom and others, a select board balked at that and felt that if we can come up with a reasonably uh, equal benefit as shown in uh, line six here with the PPA with net metering credits, that that would be an acceptable approach and would reserve the borrowing capacity for other important projects, such as Emory Grover. Um, so um, whether we will know this and have the, um, the waiver or the exception from DPU prior to April town meeting or May town meeting, it's not clear yet, um, but uh, it's possible. Um, and in any case, the warrant article um, gives the select board to the authority to enter into the PPA um, following the review of the details. Um, so we would not proceed in that direction unless and until we had a, a an adequate proposal. Um, I think that in the last meeting, we Beth had made a projection that in a PPA, we would be able to get um, 14.75 cents per kilowatt hour. And she has had further discussions with Select Energy through their pre-bid pricing on uh, power options. And um, they would agree to that with a uh, with, with a 1% escalation per year. Um, and that's exactly what she had guesstimated in her prior financial analysis. Um, so um, I, I think we're heading in the right direction. Um, the approval of the um, warrant article would only enable select board to enter into the PPA. And it would be for a duration, I think, up to uh, 30 years, which would be covered. Um, all we would need, the, the agreement with um, select energy would likely be a 25 year uh, agreement, but it does give some flexibility if it were left on for some additional period of time. Um, any questions about this? I think just a quick summary, Hank, is that really we've now provided some very viable options um, by including the PPA gives the town choice. Um, and now is the time uh, for the town to speak. And I think we've got all the material pulled together appropriately for town meeting to review and the uh, select board to put the article forth. Um, and there's nothing else really on the table till we get that vote. That, that, now, far aside the, the, the tactical stuff, because we still, we, I think there's still a, a, a payment we may want to make. And let me just ask that for a question before everybody else opens mm -hmm. up, because if we didn't do the PPA, we continue down the path, path of borrowing, we would, but it would be post town meeting uh, we still would have to make, was it 4000 or $7,000 payment, correct? We, we, we got um, PBBC approval for that invoice at right. the last meeting. 
Right. And uh, Catherine, I believe that payment has now been sent to Eversource. Yes, it has been. Okay. So tactically, there's nothing more and everything hinges on in a couple of weeks with the uh, town meeting vote. With the town meeting vote. I think that as we, depending on how long the DPU process takes, we may need to file for an extension for the net metering. Um, and we may be faced with the um, prospect, let's see, 180 days. We may be faced with the prospect of making the second payment to Eversource, but both of those or all of those would be taken into consideration in the final agreement with Select Energy. In other words, their price to us would credit those back in their mathematics, if you will. Um, at least that's been what Beth has discussed with Select Energy to date. Okay. Um, and I, th I think that um, town manager would like to be able to rescind the balance of the um, outstanding funds in Maytown meeting, but whether we will be able to or not will be determined on the, the sequence of the DPU approval. Okay, I, I don't see the screen, so I can't see whether there's other hands up. There's a question there's from Erwin. Erwin? Uh, thank you. Do, do we have a sense if the FinCom is going to support the warrant article to give the, the select board that decision-making uh, ability? My view is based on the, the meeting that I attended to with the Finance Committee, two different meetings. Um, they actually were proponents of this PPA direction. They, they'd prefer because the statement is the town's not in the business of solar power and maintenance and everything else. If PBA can take care of all of that and we can get benefit. Um, so I felt through the, from the first meeting to the second meeting, there was a lot more uh, desire for it. And if we could do the PPA and it made sense, there was even a stronger support. There was no position taken, but I, I got the impression that that was um, they would support it, but maybe they'll be neutral. I mean, okay. Others? Okay. Anything else, Hank? Um, I think the, so as we go through the next six month period, um, there may be other incidental expenses associated with contract negotiation with, with Eversource, um, but we will know more as they proceed uh, with their initial design and also as the DPU goes through the process of review of the uh, application for, for exception. Okay, well, great. Won't you also have some expenses for Beth? Well. Yes, we, we have an outstanding um, $5,000 uh, appropriation for her. So there will be uh, expenses probably each month that we'll need approval on. Yeah, because we approved an invoice last time for her services up to that point. So it would be services post that and moving forward. Correct. I think we yeah. have okay. a little over 4000 left. With that, I will close down the JCB update. And thank you, Hank, for that update. Um, we have uh, PVC, any open business, Steve Pop or anything on the open business side from your perspective? I don't have anything, Hank, do you? Anything that uh, we should. Well, I, I should just mention that we're in the midst of the um, extension of the school master plan. Uh, there have been three meetings with the uh, 
middle school um, uh, working group looking at the programming associated with uh, combining sixth, seventh, and eighth. And uh, there'll be a follow on meeting uh, with a larger group that includes now a um, member of uh, FinCom and a member from the select board as we, as um, Doran Whittier continues in the study and, and starts looking in more detail at what the options are, um, both on the Pollard site uh, and also at the other sites within town. Um, and we will we will probably look for a monthly or a bi-monthly schedule to update the PBBC on this. Okay. Is Dan still right. on? I think he... no, is Dan still Dan, on? Dan has left. Okay. I, I, I have a thought and I, I'm still concerned about this and I don't know where it gets addressed or when, but um, I'm very concerned about the impact of a sixth, seventh, eighth grade school at, at the Pollard location um, in terms of... Um, how it will impact the neighborhood, not just buses, but everything. Um, has anyone thought about looking at that as to whether or not that might be a real issue for the neighborhood? Yeah, the school committee has been looking at that and continues to go down the path of putting a sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So they don't, they don't see any problem with it? Well, I wouldn't say they don't see any problem with it. I would say that they're, they understand there is an impact, but they still believe that's the solution they would like to, to see. Well, we, we, are, we are also going through a reevaluation of the status quo option and a modified status quo option that um, in both of those cases would not bring sixth grade over to Pollard. Um, the modified status quo would be looking at renovation and addition just of um, primarily uh, science classrooms to uh, the existing Pollard and renovation of the existing Pollard, and then looking at alternatives to expansion of the sixth grade um, at IROC. Um, those, those, all of those scenarios will be reviewed again in the study. Okay. I, I just think it's a, I, if I were in that neighborhood, I would want to know you know, how, how many students of an increase are we going to have? And, uh, and has it been thought through thoroughly as to how that would impact the community? I, I don't know the numbers. Uh, I don't know if you do off your head, off the top of your head, but, but. Yeah, I mean, there, there are approximately, approximately 450 students per class per grade level. And so um, they're looking at so 900 13. to 1350. Yeah, so it'd be a one third increase in the po student population, which would also mean a one third increase of the teacher population. There would be less um, back and forth. And, and the other thing they're looking at now is the square footage associated with that um, compared to an MSBA project or six, seventh, and eighth. And because Pollard has two gyms and it has an auditorium, neither of those program elements would be allowed in a totally fresh, brand new um, MSBA project. Um, so, and even if the town goes through and figures out that they want to do Pollard first, MSBA may come back and say, well, that's all well and good. You can do Pollard first, but we're only going to support Mitchell. 
and hence the need to go through the status quo analysis as well. Have we ever had that many kids and teachers on that site? I don't think we have. No, it's, it's three quarters of the size of the high school population. Yep. Um, so it's three classes and, and four classes at the high school. So yes, it is, it is um, the big building. Um, I, I do think we've had similar numbers before we took out the sixth grade. I'd have to look back historically. Um, the, the, the sixth grade, oh, when they were previously there, the, they were accommodated in the modular classrooms, right, Steve? The modular classrooms were built in 2001, I think. I don't think the sixth grade was part of that, but um, yes, they were. Yeah, anyway. It, yeah, they it was. Were. It was. It was the middle school at that at that point in time. Yeah. But there uh, were two middle schools, weren't there? Originally, yes. No, not um, in 2001. The, the uh, Newman School was um, taken out in the what, late 90s, Steve? Catherine? Right. Yes, that's correct. And all the students in 6th, 7th, and 8th were moved over to Pollard. Right. And I believe at that time, it was about 2000, when the modulars were added to accommodate all of the, those students, total population was probably more in the 12 to 1300 student range at that time. And so then- it's, it's close to this. Closer, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just, I just continue to worry, maybe I'm just worrying out of turn here, but I, I worry about putting that many teachers and that many students in one location. Um, it, it's a real intense situation, I think, but that's- no. I think it's a well-founded concern. And it was, it was, there was a lot of dialogue about that at the time the study was being done, which was one reason why uh, Dorn Whittier was tasked to look at the impact to the site in more detail. And they did a fairly thorough detailed review of what the impact to the site was and whether the site could handle uh, the additional building square, the additional building footprint um, and parking that was necessar necessary, um, which they've done, that doesn't preclude that there's impact to the neighborhood. Uh, and George, to just looking at it from a zoning point of view, um, it would exceed the FAR that's currently allowed on the site. Mm. And so there would either need to be a waiver of those or, and or um, a change in the zoning bylaw. Um, <clears throat> from a parking perspective, they do have a layout, but it does impact the area to the, uh, I think that's the north side where the stand of trees, of pine trees are, and it also impacts part of the field play area. So um, it does have impacts on, on the site and on the building. Um, they are currently, as I think you recall, they were looking at a, um, a diagram that added a three-story building um, toward the back of the building um, in order to accommodate the square footage needed and they're still sticking with that um, diagram and are looking now at how the existing classroom spaces could be most effectively utilized. And part of the exercise we went through, um, the sixth grade principal was looking at the ability perhaps to create a sixth grade center within the building um, within the uh, single story building. Um, 
And Doran Whittier is looking at the possibility of decoupling the new addition from the existing building so that we would not be forced to um, simultaneously upgrade um, all of the code requirements within the existing building, but instead it could be stretched out. All right, I didn't want to disrupt the, the meeting for this, but, but I just thought I, I was wondering if someone uh, has essentially concluded that it would be feasible to, to do this uh, without a major impact on the community. Um, I, I don't know if you remember that we, we, we had some difficulties even putting that, um, that um, parking area out back with the people that live up on the hill from there and taking trees down on the side of that trail. That wasn't an easy process in getting approval for that. I can imagine if you go to the other side of the school and start taking down a stand of pine trees, you, you're gonna have a problem. It's, a, but, it's, not, it's not gonna be easy again, but that's, that's for another time. So sorry right, about that. Right, that's okay. I think it was a, a, a good topic to bring up, but I think we need to register that for the point that we start to engage in that level of exactly design. Um, but okay, so I think we are way over, if I may asked uh if anything else uh unless it's urgent we would just uh close this meeting down uh hearing none i will wish you all well for this week and we'll see you in a couple of weeks very good thanks good night thanks everybody good night everyone good night.